And it's my great honor to welcome a long lost friend who I haven't seen for a very long time, uh, Dr. Ellie Glasgow this morning. I'm just going to read you a bit about how this, the work that this amazing woman is doing. Uh -huh. Now, you know that Dr. Uh, Ali has connections to Tongareba, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And we've been talking about all of the connections to all of the islands and how they yeah. yeah. everywhere, right? So it's pretty exciting. Nice one. Um, background in ECE and as a, as a Pacific teacher and researcher, her work, within her work she seeks to advance Pacific education, foregrounding cultural and linguistic pedagogy and practice. Ellie has worked extensively and researched with Pacific communities both in New Zealand and overseas. Um, she's provided specialist advice in a number of contexts, both in New Zealand and in the Pacific, of course, the Cook Islands, but also uh, she wrote the Cook Islands Early <coughs> Childhood uh, Curriculum, developed that with people in the community, uh, Solomon Islands and in, in Indonesia and in East Timor. Ali's PhD investigated, that you'll be very interested in, the language, culture and traditional practices and specific language needs in New Zealand. In 2015, Ali was awarded, a, it's a very prestigious award, a Teaching and Learning Research Initiative. It's a very competitive grant you have to apply for. Mm -hmm. And in this work, she's looking at Māori and Pacific community views of infant cure practices. She's also appointed to the New Zealand Government a Advisory Group in Early Learning in 2016. So she advises the government, New Zealand government, on ECE <coughs> policy practice. Um, and lastly, Ali is also involved in a, a Victoria University funded cross educational sector between ECE and tertiary. And in that project, she looks at Pacific schools, Pacific <laughs> teachers' perceptions of the Pacific values of respect, service, and leadership. That research has been conducted in educational settings in New Zealand, Samoa, and the Cook Islands. So please give Ali a warm welcome for Kalakara. And over to you, my friends. Oh, kia ora. Um, kia ora. Marta, um, Debbie, for that, that re very full introduction. I hadn't realised I'd done all those things. No, that's that's. I really appreciate that um, that introduction. So, welcome everyone. I and I. Um, it's really lovely to ha have a privilege, the privilege of speaking to you. Um, my heart is in, in Rarotonga and um, the years that I spent there working with the Ministry of Education, I, um, I hold dear to my heart. And lovely to see some familiar faces, um, my former colleagues and um, Nina and Anna, Andrew, who was um, also one of the, the key people in, in developing our curriculum um, document. So um, I guess, all taken slightly different pro approaches, all of the people who, who have addressed you. And sorry, this room's very, um, it's actually quite shady. So um, I look at uh, working in the shadows, but. Um, so essentially I'm drawing on some of my research, but also the work that I um, conducted in the Cox, because um, I think that's quite relevant to some of the work that I understand you're working on for your, um, your qualification and hopefully you might pull on some ideas. Also love to hear from you if you've got any um, comments as we go through and certainly there'll be time um, at the end of the, the session to ask any questions. But I love having people, you know, any feedback as I go through because that also helps to um, trigger my thinking. So I'm based at Te Henangawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. And um, as Debbie has said, early childhood is my passion. I have been an early childhood teacher for, um, for decades as well. And I really believe that the early years is the prime time for language and cultural learning. So that's part of my motivation for the work that I do. Um, drawing on the work as my role as uh, early childhood advisor and curriculum developer with the group, the panel that I had, um, 204-205, Te Api Tamariki Pōtiki. Um, and I think this is very relevant as well to our Cook Island context. So I'll just move down to the next slide. Oops, why is it not? Okay. So um, 
yeah, culture and language is essentially the um, the focus, the two focus areas of my um, presentation today. And because I think how we nurture our language and our culture in the early years is will help our tamariki blossom and grow. And it links to our communication uh, strength, uh, kite karape, which um, from our um, early childhood curriculum in the cooks, the languages and the symbols of the Cook Islands culture are promoted and protected. So this is a key principle that we developed, um, that we, we maintained was a really important um, aspect of our curriculum. And um, there were measures put in place to help support that. I look at this one um, in terms of, um, and I know it was it's a Samoan saying, but I think it relates very much to our Cook Island context as well, that if there is no language, then there is no culture. If there is no culture, then all of the village will be in darkness. And this actually, this uh, image of the village is in, from Manahiki, which is one also where I have family in the Northern group. Um, and so I think what the message there is that we need our language and our culture interwoven to form that sense of identity of who we are. And we all need it all in equal measure. And the debate is really, can we have our culture and have an identity without having our language. And there's all sorts of discussions around that. But essentially, um, I think the strong belief is that our language can very easily be lost and be overtaken by English. So it's ways of how we can um, draw that back in and ensure that our language is part of not only the, our education system, but the way we live our lives and we foreground and we privilege our own home language and our own dialect. Um, so one of the missions that I have been undertaking very slowly is to learn my own um, Penryn dialect, which is one that's also dying out very uh, quickly mm -hmm. as well. I don't know if anyone in the audience is from um, Penryn Tongariwa. <laughs> um, I think it would be, oh, kia ora na. Um, it's, I think it would be safe to say that our dialects, um, we need to protect them as well as part of our identity. So um, I have to go down this way. So my outline this morning is I'm just do a little bit about my background and um, my journey to where I am now. And um, also um, drawing on some of my research but also looking at the, um, the work that we did in preparing our curriculum. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, are there any, uh, anyone in the audience who works in the early childhood? Oh, I know Mina. <laughs> Mina does early childhood um, setting and whether the curriculum is, um, is helpful in terms of your work there. Would be quite useful to get some feedback um, on that. So if we have time, we'll look at some one of my recent research uh, projects, which is the TLRI, um, which looks at Māori and Pacific, which is interesting because we found there are a lot of connections um, from our Polynesian uh, practice and our, our Māori um, kaupapa as well. Okay, so this is a bit about me. <laughs> um, so I'm from Tongariva, also a bit from Palmerston. My one of my ancestors was William Masters, so I'm one of the Masters family as well with the Tongariva branch, um, and with links to. Um, the, all the northern atolls, um, Manahiki, um, Lakahanga. My dad was stationed in the um, in Tongareva during the Second World War. Met my my beautiful mother and came back from um, the states to marry her after the war. Um, and so that's why I have Danville. He was from Danville, Indiana, um, and so they they moved to New Zealand. Um, in the 1950s for a better life, uh, as many have in the, in, um, uh, since or before. 
um, dad and mum both got jobs in the Hutt Valley in the factories there. Um, my four older siblings were born in uh, the Rarotonga or um, Tonganeva, uh, and they were fluent speakers when they came to New Zealand, but soon um, on entering school in, in um, New Zealand, they quickly lost their language. Uh, they were encouraged by my parents to um, use English only to get a good uh, education and to get a good job. Um, but I always consider Tongareva as my tūranga vaivai. Um, it was the strength of my mum's culture that we always um, remembered who we were and never forgot our culture. Um, my mum, my dad and my brother all buried back a home in the atoll. And um, so, yeah, I think it's um, a very important part of the world for me, um, overlooking the Laguna Motukuiti. Um, so although I live in a Western culture, I, it was always instilled in me that I must never forget my Cook Island roots. Um, and I think I carry that with me even into my work as a teacher and as a researcher and when talking to my students here at university as well. Um, so uh, I, I'm sure that others have uh, looked at this, but I suppose I'll... Um, some of the key motivations is in my research is looking at Pacific perspectives, particularly Polynesian. And my research is located historically, contextually, and geographically within Oceania, uh, more particularly in the southern uh, region of the South Pacific, referred to as Polynesia, the, or the Polynesian Triangle, um, and which Hoafa refers to as our Sea of Islands. So Polynesia is the name given to the triangle with New Zealand, Hawaii, Easter Island at the points, and including the many islands dotted over approximately a third of the surface of the Pacific Ocean. The traditional view is that the islands were colonized by migration from a mythical homeland. And um, these include Hawaii, the Marquesas, uh, the Tuamotus, the Society Islands, Tahiti, including Tahiti, uh, the Cook Islands, the atolls of the Northern Cook Group, Tonga, Samoa, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Ue, the Tukalaos, um, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the outliers of Tikopia, Reno, and Bologna. So there are many uh, islands that make up uh, Polynesia. I also probably need to note that um, my grandmother's from Tahiti, so I have connections back to Rurutu and um, in Tahiti as well. So I don't know, no disrespect to my Tahitian family. <laughs> so most of my research is conducted with the Pacific language nest in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Over the last two decades, um, and I'm part of the, what we call the Rethinking um, Pacific Education Movement that began in 2001, in which Pacific educators, uh, both in Aotearoa and across the wider Pacific region, um, we're seeking to reconsider Pacific education using a Pacific lens. Um, and I'll draw on some of this research in my discussion this morning. Um, I'm passionate um, about supporting the Pacific language nest movement here. And whilst I note that most of the Pacific children here in Aotearoa uh, attend the mainstream, um, some of the learning from our Pacific language nest may help to strengthen practice and ultimately work to improve our equitable um, practices for our Pacific communities. Um, so that, that's really, and it's about sort of maybe what I call reclaiming and, and reconsidering and looking at ways that Pacific education works for us here. So just a couple of statements. Um, from uh, one from Koya Baka Uta, who's at USP in Tonga, I think. And she more or less states that Pacific education in, in the Cooks and across the Pacific has been a Western, uh, um, a Western lens, really. Um, and it's prioritized a different voice to our own and a different worldview. Um, and that has really amputated or cut off our ability to um, really celebrate our own ways of being and our own ways of uh, living, really, our capacity, what we call for human agency, to have our own choices. 
So within the Pacific, the bulk of what we teach and learn in our schools and at our universities and colleges in the Pacific is what has been developed and conceptualized and um, for the Western world. So that continues. It started off even when um, at the point of colonization, our, our first schools were based on Western systems and it still continues in that way. So what some of us have said, and I think this is really valid, is that we need to start thinking of our own pedagogy, our own practice, rooted in what we in our own values and what we think is important for our children, our, our tamariki to know, so that they don't lose sense of who they are. And some of the research, even from my recent uh, PhD work, was that I was interviewing young parents and they were saying, well, you know, I know, and these were parents who had their children at the, the language nest, and they said, oh, yeah, I know that um, coming to the language nest is important, but we know that learning English is probably more important because we want our children to, to succeed. So there's still a lot of that legacy of, um, you know, promoting English and not the lack of understanding that children can have many languages in early childhood they can speak more than just English and that's the um, that's where I think the language nest has a lot to offer so there's a lot of thinking around that and it still continues now and I, I put this uh, question up by um, I think it was Makiuti Tongi who wrote um, will the Māori language of the Cook Islands die? And it's quite a strong statement real question. Um, and I think further on in the, um, in the presentation, we'll look at some of the statistics, not from the Cooks per se, but um, in New Zealand, and we can see that in fact, um, we really need to look at some ways of how we can stem our decline. Um, in my, um, and Hoafa talks about moving from the language of critique and maybe despair to what we, what are the hopeful ways? What are we, you know, how can we transform this discussion so that we start turning the tide really? And um, in my um, article that I think uh, Debbie will have given to you, which was some of the measures to preserve our language, I talk about um, Maroro Māori, which is our flying fish and how we um, jump between English and Māori within a sentence. Um, and whether we think that that is a way of, of developing new um, innovative language, it's a, is it a language shift or is it incorrect or what Balawa refers to as our bastardization of language. And he was quite, he was quite adamant that in fact, this isn't how language needs to be learned in a pure way or do we, um, we look, consider ways of evolving our language. So um, I'm not a linguist, but I think it's certainly worth considering ways of um, maybe several, several different processes that can happen for language learning to bring the numbers up. Um, yeah, but it's always about transformation as um, Hoafa states. So maybe that can be a discussion. You can maybe park that, and when we come back at the end of the um, the um, presentation, we can have a chat about your thoughts because I'm sure that you will have some different ideas about that, uh, about how children learn um, learn language. And um, so I think moving to our next slide, and this is a this is an image I didn't take. This this is one from um, you might have. Um, come across some of her work. It's Barbara Rogoff, who has worked a lot in the Pacific. She's a researcher. Um, I pulled on quite a lot of her theoretical work um, in my PhD. But it's the notion of children's competency. And I think, um, what do we what do we feel children, so does anyone, does anyone want to sit, guess what the child is, is doing there? <laughs> this is a young child in Papua New Guinea, just um, probably only maybe uh, just starting to walk. Anyone can anyone want to sort of comment on what, what he's doing there? Quite hard for us to see. Um, oh, can you, oh, can the, you not see? Oh, okay. Oh, and, and Alex. Could you expand the slide so that we don't see the ones on the side? Can you put it Oh, yeah, the, I can do that, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll just see if I can do 
I'll go up to the top. Um, There's the one. Um, so I'll have to go down. I'll just go to the. Is that, yeah. is that okay? Is that better? Slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little bit better, but yeah, it's hard. Is okay. it a kumara? Yeah, it's a, it's a coconut. He's trying to cut, he's got a machete and he's trying to um, chop the coconut. It's probably, I mean, when I show this to my students here in Aotearoa, they sort of like, they were, you know, horrified, but you can see in the background, these mum not sitting too far away. It's how we decide what competency is for, um, for our children, really. I'm just going to move my so I can see the slide everyone there. Um, and yeah, um, when, I, when I think about this, I, I'm thinking about some of the work that I did when I was working as the advisor over there in the Cooks. And I was, I think it was the Mitiara to visit the preschool there. And um, we, we, I went into the, the, class, the staff room at Kaiti to have Kaiti with the teachers. And I said to the preschool teacher, what you know what about the children who are here and um, she said oh that's fine they, their older brothers and sisters will will look after them and um when we came out at the end of that sort of half an hour later all the all the preschool children had disappeared and i thought oh my gosh where have they gone have they you know there's the lagoon on one side and, and the you know the, they have they gone into the bush but what had happened was um <laughs> one of the puppets had brought their truck down from the village and the, the, the little ones decided they didn't want to have to walk all the way back to the village because there's a quite a big walk from there to the school uh they'd hopped on the back of the truck and they'd just gone gone back home and i was thinking it would never have happened in new zealand <laughs> oh my gosh um but they were competent enough to make their own decisions about that and parent, they, they were trusted even at three, three and a half, four, that they could do that. And they, I mean, they, they had people to look after them in the village. But it, so in fact, it was, um, yeah, it was sort of a different way of looking at what our children are, you know, are competent in doing. And I think that's the whole nation of took, uh, the notion of took Tana is that when our children get to a certain age, we have certain expectations that they will um, take on the Tukana role. And um, so that was a huge learning for me. So the next slide is um, the notion of meaningful learning in culturally authentic context. So we look at another um, theorist called Paulo Freire, and I'm not sure if you've covered his work, um, but he encouraged those who are marginalized in education to question their historical and social um, situations. So we're questioning what it what you know this western framing that has been part of educational um you know sort of context for for decades you know for centuries now and he calls on that dialogue or the discussion that will allow for greater understanding and allow for culturally relevant teaching to develop so in this image this is an example of children in um the preschool Malki. um and I went to visit one morning and they'd been in the classroom with the teacher and she was doing a good job if they were learning like ABC and on the blackboard. Um, and the teacher said, oh, maybe because she knew that we were trying to develop our, our play-based play curriculum. So she said, oh, should I send these guys outside <laughs> or these children outside for, um, you know, and I said, that would be good if you've finished your lesson, they can go outside. These boys immediately went to the sandpit because it's a lovely big sandpit, uh, sandpit they have there. And they started to, to um, dig and use the blocks. They bought some blocks from outside. Does anyone want to guess what they might have been doing when they were in their play here? Is it drumming or? Um, they were actually, they were, started, they were making an umu. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were digging there, so they were making connections to their wider. Because I was watching, and I was thinking, "Gosh, I don't think I would ever see this in New Zealand." I thought, "Are they digging a road?" Or, but you know, so they were making connections to their wider world, and they were talking about digging the umu. And I thought, "Wow, that's um, yeah." So they were using the long blocks. I mean, it was very symbolic, but what I was saying through their play, they were making connections to their wider cultural world. And this is more of what we want to see our children. They need to develop this, the knowledge of how to be 
good citizens and what's um, what's required of them in this role, perhaps. Um, so when we look to some of the, re the literature, such as Bishop and Glynn, who are New Zealand um, uh, researchers, they state that teachers employing culturally relevant pedagogy, well, pedagogy is what we call our, it's loosely our artist, our art and our science of teaching. It's how we do things as teachers. So um, teaching practice is what we call our pedagogy. I know it's one of those jargon words, but um, yeah, culturally relevant pedagogy consciously created those social interactions that focus on cultural competence, as well as academic success and critical consciousness. So it's what, what they're saying is it's just as important our children learn how to be in the, the ways and the traditions and the practices of our, of our Cook Island um, society and our culture as it is to learn those other things. So these boys were making connections to their wider world and developing cultural competence, making it a traditional Māori oven. And no one, they weren't told to do this. No, the teacher didn't say, go out and, and pretend you're building an umu. That, that was just what they were making. And so as teachers, we would use this. We would use this um, if we were looking at it as a culturally uh, relevant, you know, responsive way. We might talk about what we gonna, how we're going to build the fire what are we going to put in our umu? How do we, what do we wrap our kai up in? Do we get some banana leaves and wrap? You know, how long does it need to be there? So we're extending and enhancing their learning based on their strong group interest here. Um, that's sort of developing their cultural competence. So it's a slightly different focus to um, our traditional Western ways of, of learning our, um, our, I guess, yeah, learning. So, um, so there is a strong belief that the language learning is fundamental in being a true Cook Islander. If we look at this um, statement by Jonathan and Crocom, and Crocom, so having a deep knowledge of language forged with an understanding of social, cultural and traditional mores, or that's the, the rules or values, enables an, an individual to be a fully contributing member of this of our society a true cook island maori so um going back to that little episode just in that picture here of these boys here we would be using as much of our own language and probably the milky dialect to talk about the umu and what goes in it and porka or whatever uh, ika whatever you're going to be putting in that taro um in our umu for cooking and talking about how often how often do we put our umu down is it every day or is it just on a sunday you know is it for special occasions now all of those things come into our children's learning and these guys are really so lucky to be um in their own context because our children aotearoa won't don't have the same opportunities so this is where we were going with our play-based um, curriculum our tamariki and the cooks. Um, it's also believed that we start to devalue our language and our culture when the community is deprived of our um, linguistic and cultural knowledge. So um, yeah, we need to consider those. Um, some pulling on some other work here and I'm still linking within language and culture because that's sort of the, the, the focus or the theme of my, um, my address today. Some earlier studies showed that Cook Island um, Māori in interviewed responded that the Cook Islands language was too limited and parents and some educators felt that using Māori language was a road to nowhere and this is from um, Balawa's work. Aspirations for economic development in the Cook Islands and the ability to provide the next generation with economic security was given more importance. So, I mean, we're not silly. We need, we know we need to have um, in our economic world, English is the currency. I think what um, there needs to be a, a way of rethinking how we also retain our language 
and it doesn't have to be a, a matter of either or that they can both work together. And um, so many parents who were interviewed uh, were influenced by previous language policies where Māori language was forbidden. And I know that my my mum, when she was learning school um, at school, was told English only. And I'm sure that there will be quite a few um, who may share that um, that story as well. And learning English as early as possible has had a lasting influence. And even from my my um, PhD research, talking to some of my uh, parents. Um, and even my teachers, even though working in the language nest, felt that they still felt that having um, teaching their children English was an advantage. So it's how we move from that, that very strong mindset that education has really been per quite pervasive. As I say, this is also the case in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where parents have actively encouraged the use of English and discouraged the use of Māori in order for their children to do well in education and get a good job. And that I'm a product of that, and, and um, many of us would be saying the same thing. They mistakenly consider that children will learn their own home language later in life. But unfortunately, this is increasingly difficult and not very successful. It's a lot easier, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's much easier for children to learn their language in the early years. That's when their brain is the most, um, well, we call it plastic, they can, they absorb. And um, uh, when you think of your, maybe your experience, I'm assuming that most of you guys can speak both Māori and your own language and English, thinking about when, um, what worked for you, and that would be really good to hear um, some of your uh, experiences on language learning and how you manage to use both. You are you are in the audience here. I'm sure you're all at least bilingual. Some of you might be able to speak more than more than one um, dialect. So you 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 are experts on that language learning from your own personal experiences. I like to pull on what we call our um, well, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child or what we call UNCROC. Um, we can see that it's a fundamental right of our children to learn their culture and their language. And we have to ask ourselves, why are we, why are we not doing this? So um, I put on these two articles which state every child has the right to learn the, the traditions of the particular home human society into which he or she is born. The first step is to become literate in his or her own home or indigenous language. And I guess we'd say dialect as well for our cooks because we have our, our dialects which are really important, which are, are also identity markers. Our dialects, like I call, you know, I call my Hano, where, and that's, I think we may be the only dialect in the cooks that have the H. For Hano, I'm not sure anyone else used Hano for, for family. No. no. Yeah. Huh? No. no. Uh, when, I when I use the H, I know that our Tongareva um, dialect has the H in it for, for, for family Hano. Anyhow. Northern Cox. Uh? Northern Cox. The, the Northern, Northern Cox. Cox. Yeah, yeah. So when I use that word, people immediately know that I'm um, from the Northern Cooks. So our dialect gives us our identity. And those who might use another word, think, oh, they're from Naputoro or from, from um, you know, I think that's the thing. It's really, um, or, uh, you know, so anyhow. So Article 30 of UNCROC states that a child who is Indigenous shall not be denied the right, right in a community to enjoy his or her own home language. Um, yeah, anyone, is that a comment? You weren't all right? <laughs> You're welcome to, it's a, I know that um, sounds a bit sort of funny from my end, but I'm um, happy to have any comments. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at our New Zealand um, context now and some of the demographics, um, and you might be familiar with some of these already, um, we can see that the diverse Pacific population is predominantly New Zealand born. So most of our people, um, and this is 
Polynesia, not uh, Pacific, not only the Cooks for these stats, but um, most of our Pacific population are now predominantly New Zealand born and are young, 54.9% um, um, in the 2013 census were under, younger than 25 years old. So we're a young community. Um, we, we live in the cities, we're highly urban with most of us living in Auckland. And um, by 2026, it's projected that we, our Pacific community will be will at least reach at least 480,000. So we are a fast growing group as well. And um, within that, if we look at the, um, the groups here, our Samoan group is the largest group, followed by our Cook Island group, Tonga and Ue. And the reason why I'm drawing on the 213 stats is that we had, we did have a 218 um, census, but um, unfortunately wasn't conducted particularly well. And I'm, I'm just weary that the, the, um, the statistics may not be as accurate. So I, I still use the 213 at this point until we have our next um, census. But so you can see, um, yeah, we, we're a, we are a huge presence in Aotearoa and the Cook Islands is the second largest group. Um, the next slide is really important one, I think, because um, this gives us, in terms of the language, it gives us the statistics of um, where we're at. Right? Now, we can see in our, our Cook Island um, group um, that we're not doing so well. So, we're the part of the New Zealand realm nations are Cook Islands, Niue and Tokelau. We were the ones who were taken over um, in 1900s and Tokelau a bit later on to be um, part of the New Zealand realm. So we are New Zealand citizens and we, um, we sort of accorded the same rights as, um, as all of the New Zealanders. However, it's, um, it's really if we look at our language stats, it's had a huge impact on our language. And we can see that um, in 2015, this is uh, pulling on some of John McCaffrey's work from the University of Auckland, that um, only 3% of our Cook Island community here in Aotearoa uh, could speak, under 15 could speak our language. 8% um, of those of childbearing ages, so that's those from uh, maybe 18 years um, to, well, I don't know, 40 perhaps, 8%. Um, but um, really concerningly that it's because of that, our language is considered intergenerationally extinct, which means that it won't be carried through to the next generation, that there aren't enough um, fluent Cook Island speakers to carry that language through to our, 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 um, our tamariki and our next generation. We have to be really worried about that. I know Nui and Tukulau are in a similar um, boat um, and we have to maybe look at what is it, some, and this really triggered my, my PhD research really to, well, I was in the middle of writing it at that point anyway, but it really affirmed to me that it's a really important issue. And, I'm really pleased to hear that you guys are working on this area in your diploma because um, you can bring that knowledge to your work and to your teaching. You're gonna be experts, which we really need. Um, so I'm really heartened to hear that. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> um, each of our languages for those three groups have been defined as, as generationally extinct. With regard to Pacific languages, the proposed language policy put forward by Committee Pacifica defines that Cook Islands, Māori, Niue and Tokelau and people living in New Zealand should have the opportunity and support to learn and use their heritage language. So it's recognised <coughs> that it's an important issue and um, there are strategies, but I don't think they're happening um, quickly enough. There's a lot of kōrero, a lot of talk. Um, but we really need to start getting some um, work towards it. And I'm now moving back to our, our um, curriculum that we've developed, Anna, who's sitting there in the front, um, and I with a group of others, to develop our first, um, our first curriculum document, um, Te Api Tamariki Pōtiki. And um, when we were writing 
the early childhood curriculum for the cooks, one of the key criteria or principles was to foreground the language in the early years. As you'll know that the prime time for learning language and more than one language is in the early childhood um, year period where the brain is more receptive in building those connections and pathways and developing those um, neurons um, and axioms and, and setting up those synapses to get those the brain really um, hardwired. And so there's that, plastic, uh, what do they call plasticity um, that exists and um, the more that we can, what they learn in those early years will, um, if we keep strengthening it, will remain there. Um, so if we look at the statements here from our curriculum, the fundamental goal of Cook Island's early childhood education is to promote the skills, the knowledge and attitudes, values of its people to ensure that sustainability of the language and culture of the Cook Islands is there. So, you know, we was that was one of the key principles that we put right at the very beginning. Te Reo Māori Cookie Island is the first language and will be the main language spoken at early childhood level. And I'd really be interested to see if that is still the case or whether it's still a, um, a bilingual um, process or language immersion. Its primary aim is to develop a sense of belonging to the culture and understanding of the language, our cultures, our, uh, sorry, our values and our traditions and our beliefs and our customs that form our Cook Islands culture so that children will be secure in the knowledge that they make a valued contribution to society. So really, um, you know, we've got, this is what our, our curriculum, I've got the draft here, there's a picture of it there. I keep it in my, my office and really um, we've, got, we've got a lot there. So I'm hoping that, that it is used and referred to because there's some, some good content that I didn't develop myself. It was in consultation with a lot of um, experts in the field um, in that time. I'm going to turn my thing around. So, the role of our teacher, and I don't make any apologies. I'm a play-based early childhood teacher, and I do believe that um, this is a very um, effective way of children learning um, ways of being in uh, whatever context they are in in the early childhood setting. My particular passion is the language nest because I, I truly believe that this is the, probably in Aotearoa, the only village, apart from maybe the church, where children can actually learn um, their identity and who they are and ways of being Cook Island um, Māori. So as noted in my article that I hope some of you might have read, it's a dilemma for teachers who are promoting vernacular, or that's our home, home tongue, mother, mother tongue, but at home, the parents are re reinforcing the value of English. It's not surprising that a growing number of Cook Island youth, particularly in Rarotonga, are also reflecting this, because English is being, is being seen as the language of finance. It's the, it's the language of education now, it's the language of economy, of, of tourism, everything is, um, and even I think some of the government policies um, there might be a shift towards um, Cook Island Māori, but it, um, at the time of writing this, I think English was seen as a privileged language. So I do a lot of work with our language nest here in Aotearoa. Um, and the role of the teacher is seen as more than just teaching, it's the cultural advisor. Um, and the expert in the language and the traditions is key to the centre's um, philosophy so we've got some examples of, of it happening here. Um, and also the role of the wider community and the elders and the grandparents are very much a very important part of this because we consider that, especially for our younger teachers, they haven't grown up. They, they may not be native speakers. They may not have um, been born and raised in the islands. So we pull on our people who have come from the homeland because they're the ones who know, they've got the, they've got the knowledge, they've got the expertise that we haven't had. And so um, for us in our language nest, these are our tūkana, these are our experts. And um, so it's more than a, a teacher. Um, and we, we're quickly gaining that understanding that these guys 
they're a diminishing resource and we have to learn from them very quickly. Um, otherwise, like our language, we won't have, um, we won't be able to learn how to scrape the coconut, how to do the weaving, how to do those things that, that um, maybe you guys can, you know, over and at home are part of um, everyday life, but um, we have to go to our, our language nest to learn some of these things now. So I look at um, the Cook Islands Master Plan, which was written back in 2008, and it's, it runs to 2023. Uh, I think it's Taku Ipukurea Kia Ipukurea, the Cook Islands Master Plan, which looks at learning for life and foregrounds the children's identity and the importance of language and culture in forming a strong identity as a Cook Islander. So even our documentation in our Cook Islands Master Plan, which is still there, um, um, I think should be one of the guiding um, policy uh, documents that you link to as well. Um, these are just some of the images from our language nest. This one here, um, the children doing some weaving um, and they're threading beads, I think. And this was a centre that was, um, it was always been a language nest, but they had a lot of plastic, they had a lot of Western stuff, they had a lot of tables. What they did, they decided they'd come in and they would um, start afresh and look at what would they be doing if they were in their village with their children. So they tried to make it as authentic as possible so that these kids who may never go back home for whatever reason will still have that connection to the really important practices for them to develop who they are. So they will have their karaki, they will have their pure, they will do their songs, they will do their, their hymns, their imani, um, all of that stuff. So these kids are, are gaining their sense of who they are um, because they don't have the privilege of living back home. Okay. <clears throat> So one of the tensions or the, one of the, the challenges, I guess, that exists for Cook Island parents who express a desire for their children to gain New Zealand qualifications within the Cook Islands education system um, also express the nostalgia or that, you know, they, they understand that, that wealth of knowledge that they gained from when they were children and they learned from their grandparents in the taro patch the collecting the coconuts, the weaving, the carving, the sewing, the tivai vai. They look back to how they learnt, what some of the, um, you know, the traditions and the, the practices that they learnt from their, from their um, grandparents and from the aunties and their uncles. So if we look at the indigenous model of learning, that would include these traditional practices to ensure those culturally meaningful, contextualized and authentic learning. Village learning is what is important according to Rohan. In village-based communities such as the Cooks, children are introduced to important personal relationships, the land and the sea, as well as the unique patterns of the people, their customs and their special treasures. These are the normal lessons learned daily um, that have, there's a shared responsibility uh, in the foundation of many indigenous societies. So it's that shared responsibility with she. I talk about how the papa had taken all the children back on the back of his truck back to the village. We look out for each other. And when I, I quickly learned when I was living over there that when you're given the, accorded the status of mama, your mama to all of the tamariki, you, you look out for all of the children um, around. It's a collective responsibility. Um, so traditional village-based um, initiatives support the notion of community-based learning. So we learn together. We don't go into a classroom just with one teacher. We bring our mama, we bring papas, and we talk about, they bring their expertise and they show us how um, the, way, the ways to, to learn. Um, Thus, traditional beliefs and our skills and our language, uh, one's cultural world's views and ways of being contribute to our early childhood program. So I'm, I am um, really just contextualizing this to early childhood, but 
the, what the research tells us is if children learn in the first five, six or seven years, whatever early childhood um, spans for um, each nation, that gives them a really good foundation of, of who, which they can carry through with them. If they have that really strong base, um, they will then come into systems that primary and secondary that may be more westernised. I'm hoping that, you know, that things will change as well. But for those first few years, when they're forming who they are and their, their conceptions of, um, you know, them as Cook Island citizens, the first few years have to be more authentic. Um, so the notion of spirituality is one that came through very strongly um, when we looked at um, traditional practices, particularly Christianity. Um, with Pacifica was a very strong aspect in the research that I conducted in raising infants and toddlers. The church has and continues to play a prominent and influential role in the delivery of the Pacific language nest that's here in Aotearoa. All Pacific respondents that I work with um, discuss Christian practice um, and the ways in which it is woven into their programs. Um, this may be a legacy of the origins of our language nest, which were established by the church um, historically and by the church ministers' wives. And if we look again to our Cook Islands uh, Early Childhood Curriculum document on page 13, um, a kono anga, which very much um, speaks to the spiritual realm um, and how we use that with our children in, in the early childhood um, practice. Um, and yeah, so I think that is probably enough for that one. <clears throat> Another key cultural practice that came through really um, when we were conducting research both with Māori and Cook Island Māori was the notion of tukana tēnā. And um, interestingly, um, that we were talking about this and our Māori respondents were saying, oh, we do this, you know, we have to kind of retain it. And so we were making some good connections. This is my co uh, colleague who is at the University of Waikato, Leslie Ramaka, and I, um, looking at, at culturally responsive ways of raising our infants and toddlers. And um, so there was some really good stuff, but one of the key things came out uh, that came out was um, the notion of our older children and our younger children working together and learning from each other. <clears throat> and um, the use of um, staff who could speak language fluently was essential. We couldn't, they couldn't um, really teach in this setting unless they had uh, a good strong language um, understanding. And um, as I say, these resources, our human resources of teachers is becoming um, fewer and fewer as our older generation who are fluent native speakers are starting to retire and we haven't got the new ones coming through to the same extent. So um, yeah, we, we need to start looking at that. Um, the use of our mat time was seen as a fundamental, you know, cultural practice. We all come together on, on the mat. We do our pūrē to start the day. We do our himane, we, we, we talk, we maybe do what we call our mihi, um, where children introduce themselves and they, they, they um, bring in their ancestors, they talk about who their, their parents and their grandparents and where they're from. All of that stuff is important um, way of establishing our day um, in our language nest. And um, from our Samoan context, um, so in, in our research, I need to go back a bit, we looked at... Um, <clears throat> Samoa, the Cooks, and Tokelau uh, were the three Pacific nations that we used for the TLRI um, project, and um, as well as three Māori um, Ponareo centres. So we were pulling on from a range of different um, contexts there. Um, yeah, but in terms of language, um, embracing the traditional language and culture of the Cook Islands in their routines. Uh, in this language, most staff speak Cook Islands Māori and have a strong knowledge of the culture being Cook Islands born, and that was seen as a huge advantage. So they were really our tuakana. <clears throat> Even though I have a university education, when I go to my language nest, I'm tēnā, because these guys 
they have far more knowledge than me and I'm just you know I'm in awe of what they can teach me so I, I go there to learn um, they're my teachers um, the notion of professional practice um, <clears throat> at the beginning I talked about Koya Vakauta's work and how we privilege Western theory and pedagogy you know we've put those things up on a pedestal and some of us who've done maybe trained in New Zealand like Mina will know about Vygotsky and Bromfrombrina and Piaget and all those Western theorists that we as, as teachers we um, we learned at training college uh, at the expense of other ways in uh, time to sort of move the, um, the emphasis I guess if we are to strive for more equitable practice for our Pacific communities we need to consider the attributes and the skills and the knowledge of our teacher trainees we recruit into um, our ITE programs or it's our initial teacher education programs. So having a strong authentic knowledge of Pacific practices, for instance, which herbs to grow to mix with the coconut oil for skin ailments, when, for planting and for fishing, the protocols required for formal ceremonies um, that, that children need to learn how to behave, you know, in, in our, um, in the different contexts. And fluency in our language should be all really uh, requirements of our teaching. The challenge is this human resource is rapidly dwindling, as I said. We need to use these skilled and knowledgeable members of our Pacific community to educate our student teachers. This applies to professional development as well. Um, so teachers are already out there in the field and I'm talking probably more about our New Zealand context because I'm, I'm a bit out of touch with what happens in, um, in our preschools in um, the Cook Islands now. But learning such things as the importance of the hair cutting ceremony, um, te vai vai, um, just learning everything. In New Zealand, every, once a year we have our Cook Islands Language Week and this is the language, this is where our centres get together and even our mainstream, our kindergartens, they will, they will have a lot of things that represent Cook Islands Māori. And my thinking is for our language, it needs to be Cook Islands Language Week every week, not just one week of the year, it needs to be every week where um, it's totally, when I walk into the centre, it's like walking back into a village. So I'll see our coconut, um, you know, our, our banana palms growing and we'll have our music playing and walking into um, not, a, not just the, the, the kindergarten or the preschool, this is walking into our, our, our early childhood nest. Um, <clears throat> that's, our, that's our dream. And a lot of our, our um, language teachers have really worked hard and they put a lot of their passion and their... Um, uh, energy and time into making sure and that commitment to ensuring our language is um, still um, retained and maintained and revitalized but it's an ongoing battle because what ha is happening is that our, our ministry sometimes will have um, policies that work against a language nest. Um, I talk about how in the old days we had um, like maybe a group would set up uh, like a, a language nest in the, in the local hall or even sometimes in someone's converted garage because they could see that their, their children needed, to, uh, we were really worried our language was going to be dead. So they did it with their own resources, there wasn't a lot of government funding, there was, you know, people would just pull on, oh mama will come in and she will show us how to, to weave the, um, you know, whatever, you know, the baskets or whatever. So we, we, we pulled on our community resources. And uh, in Aotearoa, back in the day, we there was the beginning of our Pacifica group of, of Pacific women that would come together. And they were they were quite a strong um, movement back then to really get things moving. Unfortunately, the Ministry of Education came in in the early 90s and said, well, hold on, if you want to get any money from us, you all have to be trained. You all have to be licensed. You all have to do this, this, and this. Those are all these policies that came into play, which immediately cut out some of these community groups 
um, because not everyone was going to be wanting to be going to training college for three years to get a qualification. And not everyone wanted to be at the language nest for, for six or seven or eight hours a day. Originally, they were the play group. They could drop in. They could come in with their mokopona. Some of our, our, um, our mamas would come in with their moko, then have a chat, have a, you know, um, talk to the others and then wander home. They didn't, want, they didn't want to be the trained teachers. And so we were immediately, once those policies came into place and our curriculum, immediately cut out a lot of the people that we needed to be there. And so it hasn't worked in our favour. And I really um, feel sad that we, we haven't had um, that. I mean, even now, some of our centres are still closing down our language nest because of the, often about financial, is the governance things. Um, they're not getting the support from the ministry that they need. The ministry is slowly waking up to it, but it's, um, yeah, it's still very heartbreaking sometimes to, to see that they're not getting the support that they need for this really important mahi, this really important work. Um, because we know that our Pacific communities are the fastest growing in Aotearoa. Therefore, our group of priority learners are growing as well. And so our priorities are, we need to be asked, what are our priorities? And at the moment, it's very slow to take, to, um, to take off. But I would really think that we need to reconsider the role of the teacher. And it's not having a trained diploma of teaching or degree in teaching. What can you bring from your cultural background as an expert is how I see the teacher. It's, um, you know, it's that notion of tika, the, the, the correct practice um, is, you know, so that we don't learn different, different ways. We need to learn the correct ways from our experts. And having, going to training college and learning a whole pile of Western theories is actually taking you away often because some of my, um, from this research, some of my teachers were saying, well, I had to take off my Western hat for all my training to come and work in this place because what I'd learned was all this stuff here and it's not what I needed to know. I needed to learn from my, uh, my elders that actually this is the important stuff. So I've got all the Western theory under the sun. I know all about scaffolding and, you know, co-construction, all that stuff. But hey, I need to know more about this. And in the process of that, I'm learning who I am as a Cook Island Māori as well, because a lot of us have been so assimilated and so moved away from our culture that it's really hard to get back. And, you know, speaking to someone who born and raised in Aotearoa, New Zealand, of half caste, you know, dad, American mum, um, very strong in her culture, it's a hard battle. And so I represent probably quite a few who are, have Maybe I can say I'm successful in education, but in terms of my culture and my identity, I've still got a long way to go. And um, so I've, I really look to you guys as, as the experts. You are so lucky in many ways, especially to be able to live over there. Um, but I, I, I think you can bring a lot to your work, um, you know, based on the work that you're covering and this qualification, you know, I think it's fantastic and um, fully applaud it. So, just looking at the time, oh yeah. So the next one, just to conclude then. Um, so this presentation uh, was re really looking at um, a take on Cook Island society from an early childhood educational perspective and uh, in particular the Ministry of Education. Um, that they take ownership and develop initiatives that will stem, will stop that Western domination and enhance traditional practices, knowledge and values. And for us to be strong enough to stand up and say, you know, enough, we're taking over from here um, because we've got too much to lose and we've lost so much already that in fact, it's now you guys as our experts to, to come in and lead the battle really so I, I talked about the metaphor of maroro Māori, which is the flying fish flying in and out of English and Māori, and there'll be a whole range of different linguists who say, oh, it needs to be immersion, and, you know, or innovative practices is about how our children learn 
And um, as long as they're learning language, they will, uh, once they've got a, an idea or they've got a, a set of phrases and languages, language skills, then they can build on that. So I'm not a linguist, but I do know that our language nest, um, which I really, I know that, um, I'm not sure, I, I need to come back to the Cooks once the, the board is open the other way to see what's happening there, but I know that the um, the model that was set up in um, by Ina uh, Tamarua um, over on the other side of the island um, is one, I think, is that where you're teaching at the moment, Mina, which was more of a language nest um, sort of model based on the play-based model. Um, can, you know, we can do some really good work um, in, in restoring yeah work in early childhood. So this is our strength. We, we are adaptable, we are creative, and um, despite all of the challenges, we still hold strong to our identity. And I think we have to be justly proud of that. Um, so me takimata. I have got some other slides you're welcome to look at. I won't go into those because I've gone over my time almost now. And I'd like to spend some time if there are any questions. Um, but the, 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 the last few slides are just based on the research. Um, I suppose I could quickly flick through. I'll just show you some of the images. Um, I won't talk to them too long, but it's, these, are, these are actually our language nests and the Cook Island language nest here in, our, in Wellington. So um, we had some okay. questions. Yeah, and, Kia ora, um, Yes. Just going back to that model of uh, fish uh, language that we use. Yeah. When I first got here, um, I, I was excited that I was going to use Maori. <laughs> but when I started talking to them in Maori, they just stared at me. So I had to use my second language as English to speak to oh. Oh. And now that's what we're doing. Mm. Because yep. they go home, they speak English. Mm. Yes. It's like yep. being in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. It's like being in New Zealand. At the moment, it's still the same. But in our school, mm. ICE, year one, year two, year three, we are focusing on Maori. Teach all of them in Maori, especially. Preschool. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And then four, five, and six, they go English. That's very good to hear. Yeah. I think, um, Amina, you're you're strong enough in, in your practice to um, to make sure that that happens as well. I mean, I think what you bring, because I, I know um, you bring a wealth of experience and expertise in working in both the mainstream and in the language nest, and as a tutor as well, that um, you've, you've got enough um, understanding as of what's important. And Māroro Māori, I think, you know, you know, I think a lot of us do speak in language where we might put a bit of the English word in, as long as we've got the, the, the sentence structure, then it's a good model. You know what I mean? I think I, I, I think maybe we need to sort of come off our high horse a little bit. One of the one of the tricky things I think that a lot of our young our youth um, talked about was that they felt really embarrassed to try and use their language because some of the elders would laugh at them. And and so they would they would they could Someone said, I can understand it, I can listen, I know what they're saying, but I'm too scared to say anything in case I put my foot wrong, you know, or I say the wrong word. So I think there has to be a sense of, oh, look, let's just not be so tough on these guys, at least they're trying to learn. And Maroro, Māori, maybe a model where they can say, well, actually, I'm, I'm still learning. I know that I can't, I don't know the Māori word for this, but the English is this, so I'll say core, you know, whatever, whatever the language, the sentence might be. But, um, Thank you, Mina. That's really helpful. Um, and it's um, the, the, the new words, the, the technology words, are also a, um, is an area that we don't have the words for them in Maori. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. end up adding our own little words, words beside it. So it becomes 
karetan. Karetan ni wa. Ali, I have some. Can I? Can I speak? Okay. Um, I'm from Mamaya. I know my aunt is speaking their own language. It's uh, the problem is over here in Rabu. I'm glad I've been here. I've been teaching in Takitim school for, I think, for eight years now. I'm glad I'm in the right place because I live my life. I live my life. And lucky when we moved here in Rarotonga, all my children, they can speak the language Mama you fluently. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm too scared about my uh, mokopunas. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You, when I arrived here, the first language of Rarotonga was English. Mm. That's not nice. Mm. So I'm, I'm glad in our Takitumu school, I'm not too sure about the other school, but the Takitumu, we are trying to live our name. Mm. So we are providing ways as teachers to find ways how we are going to, uh, to teach our children about the real, like what my friend Mama Mina was saying earlier. Mm. Mm. If you just be a uh, Maori children, they just yell at you. But we have a plan. You have to speak them in Maori and then you translate into English. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I'm now I'm in the right place in Rarotonga in order because I could see your emphasizing all of us cook islands because mm -hmm. as we, as we are seeing now yes i agree that one day our rail gonna die mm -hmm. lost yes. yeah and mm -hmm. comparing to the new zealand mm -hmm. and even Samoa, in new zealand i guess they are trying to live what embarrassing to all of us see in Rabatola especially but I'm, I, I guess it's all right for the outer island, but I'm not too sure about that. Mm. I'm not too sure about that. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I speak the English. It's too hard for the, especially the teenagers to speak the language. Mm. It's too hard for them. Yeah. They speak their own language. That's all for me. Yeah, Thank you. I think. That's, thank you so much. That's really, um, really great to hear. And um, as I say, you are an expert. You bring that expertise with you from your, um, from your home island. And I think um, from my experience of traveling around the outer islands, I was really lucky in my role um, that there is a lot more um, probably proper language or authentic language taught in the outer islands. Children are, are getting a better um, model in Rarotonga, as you say, there's a lot of English spoken, and it's it's hard for our children because um, I, English is a lot easier to speak. You know, you can you can sort of get your meaning across in one or two words, whereas in our our language, we we speak the whole sentence. But that shouldn't be an excuse. Um, from my oh, report, I was finding that my children were um, like the teachers would speak to them in, in Cook Island Maori, and they would answer in English. So that the understanding was that, but the next step for my research is actually getting them to speak back, you know? So it's almost like as our language evolving so they understand, they can hear, they know what the teacher's saying, but they respond in English. Um, so that's the next task is to get them to actually speak the phrases, to speak the words, but um, yeah. Some, some, someone had a comment? I've, I was oh, sorry. I was going to say that uh, the, the the teachers, the teachers that you you don't need them to be qualified no. to teach in preschool. Yeah. No. I actually remember when I started Puna Mario in uh, yeah. Yeah. in Wellington. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had to get some mamas mm -hmm. to come oh. over. Yeah. And what we did was because they weren't helping out 
I was the one who went and did the training with play activities. Mm. I had to ask them to remember what they used to do when they were little. Mm. Yeah. And she right. said, oh, it is, it is Kiko. Uh -huh. I'm right here. Uh -huh. Those are the activities. You bring it in and you teach our mm. children. Mm. Or the or mm. all, all those things. Mm. They, even if you but you have to keep an eye on the papata so children don't put it in their mouth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when we don't have the dolls, um the roll the towel up, hold it, and then get a ribbon and tie it around to be the doll. <laughs> and then you can put it in the bath. All those things. Those are yeah. And also the kanakan, you get the mama to come, get the kana, and show the children how to come at the akari. Mm. Yeah. Or yeah. amanipui, mm. get the children to help uh, peel the bananas, put them in the bowl, get a mash up, and get them to make it for you. Yeah. yeah. And that's from yeah. the, the mamas and the papas that come over to help out. Okay, Mara. Yeah. Um, Ali, what a beautiful presentation. Um, I really like um, how you use the thing of talk on a perspective, right? And in your um, also in your the reading, and, and you mentioned that so uh, not long ago. Um, bringing up a child is not just the responsibility of the parents in the home. Um, but it's a collective responsibility, and I really, really um, support that. Yeah, so it's a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Uh, I really thank you for that. Ellie, thank you. Metaki, yes, it's James here. Um, hi, James. Oh, hi, James. Oh, oh, Debbie's James. <laughs> Debbie. Sorry. Uh, I, can, I can only see little folk, but uh, hi, James. Nice to see you. Um, it, it sort of work done around. I know that in Kwanga uh, Reo context, they had a position mm. which was known as uh, Kayarihi Reo. Mm. Kayarihi Reo was an elder person mm. who was knowledgeable with the language, whose job was just to go into the uh, Kohanga Reo and speak Māori only. Mm -hmm. only speak Māori. If there's any translating that needed to be done, it was done by other teachers in the unit so yeah. that the kids yeah. had this person speaking in Māori 100% of the time. Yeah, yeah. So their receptive skills were taking in the language. Uh, yeah. They were being reinforced with um, ways of understanding that the teachers were able to then sort of help the children to understand that kind of skill. Is there any sort of thing in mm -hmm. terms of um, value in that sort of yeah, um, you'll find actually, um, James, that the kohang have become they've become quite hard out, and it is total immersion now. You can't go into a kohanga and not use Maori. Um, as a consequence, there's, there's been a breakaway group called Te Punere, or which um, focuses more on a bilingual um, because they understand that a lot of people can't speak Māori and they're learning, so they, it's part of their journey is they, they, they use it in a bilingual process. In, um, in the Cook Island languages that I've worked with and the other Pacific languages, they tend to, um, because the stats are so dire, they've had to be pragmatic and, and use a bilingual approach. But I really, um, I don't know if you've looked at some of Sally Nicholas's work, who's just done her thesis on with linguistics, and she, I had a conversation with her and she said it, for her, it has to be total immersion, um, yeah. which makes it really, really tricky because we don't have the language, the language teachers, but that would be the ideal, is that when children come into this place and parents and visitors and any, everyone else, like you take off your shoes and you put on your portai to speak Cook Island language, Māori, and you come in. I mean, usually it's Rarotonga dialect. You then have to maybe put yourself out there because it's really... Um, if we privilege Cook Island Māori language in this place, then you have to quickly learn some of the, the phrases, uh, some of the ways of, you know, um, acting in this place to make sure that you, 
yeah, it's it's a really it's a real challenge, but that would be the ideal, is to to make the place our language needs total immersion. But at the moment they are, it's a bit like Māori or Māori or the bilingual. The problem is it's the percentage of Māori and the percentage of English. Generally, it's a huge more percentage of English, and it wasn't until I actually say to the teachers, well, you know, where's all Māori this morning? They start thinking. Oh, I better start using that a bit more. It's very easy to slip to English as the only language of choice. And um, unless centres come up with a, a blanket policy and say, no, it's total immersion, like our kohanga, um, although I'm not sure that it's actually authentic, they do say it's total immersion. Um, it's, it's, it's a continuing you know, challenge for, for us. Um, I do think, though, James, what has happened in New Zealand is the kōhanga have had a really, you know, those children, those first um, children who were enrolled in kōhanga have now gone into kūra kōpapa, and they've come out as graduates of those um, early, those education systems, and they have a really strong language base and a strong sense of identity. So for me, is um, some of the other research I've been involved with is that once children leave the early childhood centre, once they lose, lose, leave their language nest, by the time they finish their first year at primary school, they're speaking and um, they're fluent in English and they've lost their home language. Our education system here in Aotearoa doesn't support children's language learning after their first five years. Um, so we've got quite a few structural things to sort of put in place for our children. Um, but yeah, we've seen the first batch of our uh, kohanga reo graduates in their early uh, 20s, 30s now, who are now replacing some of the um, the others in our languages because they've they've come through the system, they've come through a, an alternative education system via kura kopapa, even going on to the wānanga. So that that, that um, which really sets them up well. In an ideal situation in, in Cook Islands, that's what we would like there really is to have our own, um, say, no English spoken in preschool. You know, we've got enough language speakers there to say it's only Māori. Um, and once they get to primary school, that's when they start introducing English. That's an ideal, but that's what, something to work towards anyway. Everybody is nodding their heads, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ali. Can you just take the screen uh, share off now, please? Screen share off? Okay. So I'll just... And, uh, question and, the and then, there we go. I have the two more questions and then we'll have to finish, okay? That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. Ali, Rick, I have a memo. Oh, I'm just going to finish for the other final minute. Three things that came out of your presentation today, which has captured my interest. The oh, first one, the uh, intergenerational extension. Yes. The term that you use is very powerful, and it's really hurting me. Mm. It's really hurting me, and me now. When you define that, we're not going to survive. That's why we are here. Uh, this class here for that reason for that reason it, it's really pain and then the second uh, second issue that I would like to bring to is the, the master plan the master plan that was created by the Ministry of Education that they mm. need to be looked at yeah. and uh, where we are you are correct where are where is the education uh, stance on this issue uh, they don't have anything yet See, the policy of the, the language, it's one thing that it's hurting me now. Mm. They, haven't, they haven't done mm. anything yet since 1995, which is the pure mm. language itself. And it be the total emission, emission, emission. I am a believer in total emission mm. from TE to grade three. Two years ago, I went to the established sister. I don't know if you heard about Pat Newman uh, up, yes. up north. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I, because she got some good teaching practices about merging culture and values, uh, mm. looking after our own. Mm. So, uh, so the play base you were mentioning from EC right to grade three, that is what I am trying to push in my school, and through so the sort of yeah. love of reading, 
the, you know, the total mission. But however, the ministry uh, gave the, the option yeah. to the other schools with the policy yeah, whether to follow the three three options been given uh, to the schools, and that is where the the concern is. Mm. So for me, I want a policy for Kuka and Maori alone. Yes. And I want an English policy alone or a dual policy alone. Yeah. So this is where I'm coming from. Teachers, the system itself is confused. Yeah. Mm. So mm. that's why that people are not not uh, what you call not strong enough. They don't have the the faith or whatever the trust in this system to continue teaching. So I, because I understand about the total marriage, I go into my school, I go in my class, I'll tell them Maori, 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 Maori. But there are so many buts. Yes. Yeah. From, uh, yeah. Confident. Yeah. Uh, the first language, second language issues, all things is coming from us. I, I hear you, I, I feel you uh, when you're talking about Trio. Thank you very much. I'm just here to, to like to, to thank you on this issue. At least you have given some, some highways to clear the road for us, clear some more road for us to, to get our language. I believe that our language needs to there is a foundation. You must have a foundation a left. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And I, I strongly believe that our real mm. should be the foundation or the first language mm. of instruction. That, like, like, like any series can come up with. Uh, when once you have a, a strong language, it's easy to learn any language. So that's. That's what I want to share with Ali. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mata, that was very, really, really. Um, your your words are, are so important, and I think I share I share um, your ideas. And um, I think there is a lot of work that you guys um, in your roles there in in, in the Cooks can. Um, can be part of this movement. You know, you're a collective group here. You're going, to, you're, you're actually looking at these these ideas and maybe the policy initiatives, as you say, you, if there are if there's um, not a clear policy directive, you need to lobby the government and say this is you know really this the research and the stats are telling us um, that in fact it's time to to really review this. I mean even in the in the mid-2000s, when we were working there, um, the, the work of Henrika Wilson and others in that, um, that language policy space, um, they were making some really good inroads, but it sounds to me as if that work still needs to continue. And um, But it's it's a journey that we're on and we're all sharing together. It's uh, it, If we've got that collective voice, if we're all working um, in this, um, on the road together, then we're going to make um make a difference we will make um you know there'll, there'll be our shared voices and the shared ideas and you, you're the ones who are the experts you're out in the field you're out there working you're teaching at the moment and you can actually make those decisions you can actually push back and say well i you know for the rights of my community the rights of my society and my children i am going to be using english uh cook island maori and i'm not you know for increasingly, um, you know, in my practice and for my children, and and just do it because you know that this is the right way to do it. It's, you know, it's tikka, it's the right way. And you've got to just do it for for ourselves, for our children, for the next generation coming through. There aren't many of you who of us who've got your skills. You are an expert. You are a tūkana, and you have that the duty, I think, to to just um, to do this in your capacity as teachers. Um, go back and look at what's happening now. Have a discussion with the teachers in your school and say, what's our language policy? What are we going to do about this? Let's rewrite it. We've got the, um, even if it is, you don't have the backing of the ministry, what you have in your pol language policy is going to be what's important for you in your, in your school, in your early childhood setting. You can do that. You're the experts. 
And if you have pushback from the ministry, you've got enough understanding of why you can you can respond with why we need to do this. Um, so I, I really um, support you strongly in your um, in your journeys. But I know that Debbie's saying it's time. So. Question because we've got Aki Nicholas in a, in yep. a short while. So that's all right. That's all right. I've yeah. I have a thank you. Thank you. This program, so yeah, definitely connections with uh, Aki. But we've got one last question, and then we will close. All right, that's fine. We've got so many words of wisdom, but um, they need a little break before they start the next. Interview. They do. <laughs> All right. All right. Kia ora, Nali. Um, I'm Tukmati from Aitutaki. Um, I I fully support. Um, the initiative and even mm -hmm. what you have uh, presented today and it seems that it has been um, the best has been saved for the last oh. so um, I think this because this really um, links to our mm -hmm. our research mm -hmm. and um, just some a few not a question but I think um, I look at when I look at the the teachers today. Uh, we have teachers who are strongly uh, for our language, and we have teachers that are strongly for English. So I, as uh, Rita was saying, you know, Cook Island Maori should be in ECE right through to grade three only because you have teachers in those classrooms who are teaching both languages. And um, I have, I've seen one principal who takes nothing from, he doesn't even um, consult with the ministry, but he does what he wants for his school because he sees what his school needs. And that's the principal in Mangaia, Mangaia College. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. The problem is not only in the school, the problem is with the leaders of this country as well. Yeah. We have local news every night. They come on the, the, the TV and they speak in English mm. yeah. instead of speaking their own language. Mm. So who is there to listen to them speaking in English? We have elderly people mm. who don't even understand what they're saying. Mm. And just last night, I was sitting there and listening to, this was the theological college graduation, Takamoa, and they were speaking English, these leaders, which they shouldn't be. No. It should be a full-on Cook Island Maori um, um. event. Mm. So, you know, it doesn't, the problem is not only in the schools, it's not only with the teachers, mm. it's also with those who have the power in mm. this country mm. and I, they are the ones who are letting us down yeah. Yeah. Is where our language mm. is fading I, so yeah. um i i myself i i was pretty upset last night yeah. just listening to them on a local news you have mm. new zealand one new zealand news that's all english and then our local news should be in maori oh. Right. Even yeah. those who work there don't even speak the language. Mm. So yeah. it's very upsetting. It and is. so, and also we have had workshops. Principals have been meeting here in Rarotonga. So where's what they have um, discussed? Where has it gone to? Don't know where. Mm. So the ministry has taken everything and done it their way, how they want it, mm. instead mm. of taking what the other schools have asked for you know just working with the schools yeah. so that what that's my my um problem with the language but thank you very much Meitaki. yeah i think you're right it has to start at the top it has to start at the with the leaders um there yeah because that will also filter down as well but good to hear that that principal is doing his own thing because he you know that's the thing, you can do it. You know, if you can respond to why, you, no one can argue that our language is the most important thing. It's our treasure, it's our guiding lamp. And if we don't 
have it there, well, what have we got? You know, we, we lose a huge sense of who we are. So keep battling away. It's, you know, it is a battle for you guys. You're the ones who are going to have to stand up and, and respond. But um, yeah, before it gets any worse, we can start stemming, pushing back. <laughs> but no, that, thank you for those comments. Well, I better let you go because I know you've got Ake coming in. So thank you for the privilege of allowing me to um, talk to you today and hopefully you might come over and visit sometime. But um, okay. Bye. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Have, have a good have a good day. Kakite. Hold on. Ali, I'm Anna wants to say something. Oh, Anna. Yes, Anna. Oh, Anna. Yes, 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 An